Okay, but the normal stop time is. Yeah, it's 10.15. 10.15, like okay. Yeah, that's cool. I'll try to keep it on track. Yeah, all right, cool. All right, sweet. So, following Dan is going to be hard because he was awesome today. He was on fire. Um, but I'm going to dig a little bit deeper into a lot of the things he talked about, but just go a hair deeper into the standards and how they work and why. And um, essentially, like, if you think about it, like, backing up and thinking about it as a whole, the problem with the industry is if we don't have a standard, you can't consume, for example, a perfect example is say you want to use a registry server to Amazon. Say you want to build locally, build an image, push out to Amazon, push to Docker Hub, push to your own built-in registry. You have to have a standard that everybody can comply to so that you can have true portability. Like the idea of the cloud, right, is I can move things back and forth and make it easy. And so it's, it's a mixture of products provided by companies, community projects created by individuals and communities and um, you know and services essentially that that are also by products you know or by by companies and so if you don't have that you know you can't you have you have bags box barrels and crates as I used to say they're all different sizes and trying to put them on a ship you have to stack them all and so really the idea the, the literally the good the analogy is basically shipping containers um, you know and people don't think, th this is a conversation I've had a lot. In fact, this week I had it with uh, the, the Scilabs guys, the guys that do Singularity, because, because they have a different format. But I'm, and and we, were, we were discussing, like, where should they plug into the ecosystem, right? Like, this is a conversation that if you, if you put your head down for five minutes to start working and you lift your head, you're like, oh, man, where do I fit into this ecosystem? Like, do I build to the CRI spec? Do I build to the OCI spec? Like, where do I fit in and where don't I fit in? Should I use the Docker CLI? You know, some people have integrated with the Docker uh, socket, things like that. And, and you end up in dangerous situations where you're like, the world moves and, you know, tectonic plates shift, and then now your stuff doesn't work right because... Uh, something broke with a version change. And so really what I want to dig into in this talk is kind of like, where should you integrate? Where do these standards protect you? Where don't they protect you? Um, what do you really get from all these? And I mean, Dan did a great job because we've built an ecosystem of tools around with Builder, Scopio, Podman that actually work using a lot of these standards. So we have a lot of you know expertise in figuring out where these things should fit and where you can invest long term. And so, you know, if, to have this healthy ecosystem of, you know, things where people can go off and innovate and do things, but then lift their head back up and their tool still works in the ecosystem, you pretty much have to have well-defined interfaces and well-defined standards. And so I'm going to dig into a few, about five of them, actually. So the solution, right, like I mentioned, is open standards. You have to have well-defined interfaces and, and open standards. And so... You need to be able to have this happen, right? I need to be able to swap any one of these out in certain places, right? Like the world started with Docker. They invented the concept of a container engine, at which yesterday I talked about is really basically a giant proof of concept, right? That word Docker means so many things. It's a company. It's an API. It's a daemon. It's a, it was a format for images. It was also an ecosystem of images out on Docker Hub. And the only way to kind of sell the world on how to, you know, how to do containers in this new way was to kind of build this giant proof of concept. And that was the genius. But the downside is now four years later, you know, you've got everything munged into this giant proof of concept. And that is bad because it's really hard when you want to make a small change. Like, like the, Dan brought up the example of Rocket wanted to, you know, wants to integrate in Kubernetes, but Kubernetes is hardwired to, to Docker. That's a bad scenario, right? Or you want to have a standard spec on what images they pull, obviously. Like, so we've, we've chipped away at different pieces of this to make it so that these things are pluggable. And now, today, 2018, we're actually in a really good spot where you can plug these different things in and essentially every one of these does the same job and I'll dig in deeper and where they all fit in and why they work. So... I, 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 a long time ago, this few, several years back, I went back and kind of revisited the original, like four years ago, four and a half years ago, whatever that was, when Docker first came out. A lot of people made the shipping analogy, right? And and uh, I actually went back and dug into some of the ISO standards around actual shipping containers because they're so they're apropos to the to the you know to the software containers. And like one of the ones that were actually really interesting to me was like ISO 1161, hook dimensions and strength. So I just pictured like right there was some point in history where some guy was operating a crane, get, you know, tried to lift the container and the top tore off. And, you know, who knows, like the container fell out and, you know, all the stuff fell out everywhere because nobody had ever standardized, like, what is the strength, the tensile strength of, you know, the corners and the hooks and things like that. Um, and really the same, you know, we went through that same process in, in containers in that now we have an actual standard for, like, what the images look like. Um, how and, and this also highlights, like, like not just... 
the image, but right, the tooling. So like the cranes, right? I want to be able to buy one set of cranes that can move these containers around. I want to invest in those cranes because I'm going to buy them for like 30 years. And so the, the, the business problems that are associated with that become a lot more obvious when you're building physical stuff because software feels like you can change it really fast, but in reality, nobody wants to once they put it in production. So you want to put a, you want to you know, adopt a standard because I still want to get value out of whatever I built in five years or three years or even as a, as a, I, I have some upstream stuff that I've built and like I'm lazy, right? I don't want to go change it just because something changed. I don't want to have to constantly rewire it. I just want to build to the spec and say, okay, it should work. So that's what I'm kind of trying to highlight by making this analogy with the with the you know shipping the actual real shipping container. And so these are the five specs that I just want to like dig into, and they're they're actually similar. I would say these two on the end are really def well defined interfaces. They're not actually, or I'd call them community driven kind of standards. And then these are actually like standards body standards. These three. So um, you know, there's there's a spec for images, like the actual image format on disk and when you're moving around. Then there's a standard now which is recent for distribution. So that's like moving it between you know registry and cache or between registry servers which is what Scopio works on. Um, and then there is the runtime specification, which actually explains, and I'll dig deeper into it, but it kind of explains how you take all the stuff that's in the container image and turn it into a running process and all the translation that happens between talking to the kernel. Um, CRI does the same thing on the network side in a very similar way, except that there are pluggable binaries that can do the work instead of run C is kind of the standard that most people do, although it's pluggable as well. Um, and I'll dig into that a little bit. And then and then CNI, oh, I'm sorry, CNI is what I'm talking about. And then CRI is really an, an interface between the kubelet and the container engine. And actually that one came up the other day. I mentioned the anecdote of, of where does where should like the Scilabs guys from Singularity, they have a really cool um, you know, they have a cool container engine, essentially, is what they have. But they never were quite sure where they fit in and where they wanted to play in the space. And they, they play in HPC, and in HPC, they built their own image format that's not OCI compliant, right? So now they're kind of trapped in that world. But that's that's good and bad. It allows them to go innovate, and they can do things that maybe HPC users want. Maybe HPC users do want to ship the data around with the container image, which is what they do, essentially. OCI images do not do that. OCI images are just the code. Uh, the data lives locally. But the cool part is with CRI, two different groups can build a CRI compliant container engine and then Kubernetes can just talk to it or CRI CTL which I'll dig into can just talk to it and you can list the images see them there even if they're different formats doesn't really matter so the beauty of understanding these is that you can kind of understand where your project should fit in where you should build where you can rely on things that you know that your stuff will work and then as an architect somebody building a, an environment knowing where these work you can kind of know which projects you want to investigate like like if I'm looking at a project like personally I would be a little bit apprehensive if Singularity didn't comply to the CR interface, because there's probably places where I'd want to be able to call it through this standard interface. So I'm going to focus on kind of CRI, CNI, and OCI, those three main you know, sets of standards, if you will. So I showed this slide yesterday, and it's the only one I'm going to show from my other one. But this is kind of the full money, right, of like what a container engine does. And I walked through it kind of, you know, if you think about it, a lot of it took me a long time to boil down like what is actually happening in a container engine. Um, there are essentially, and I'm going to dig deep, deep into this in some future slides, but it's really a conglomeration of options that are specified in the container image as metadata, options that are specified as defaults in the container engine, user overridden you know, options that they pass as command line options or either that or through YAML and Kubernetes, which then get passed to the Kubelet, which then gets passed to the container engine. But in a nutshell, it's image defined, engine defined, and human defined options all get combined into something that then gets passed to run C and you know, which is an OCI runtime standard, and then the CNI plugins, which are also binaries that take uh, a config blob that's very similar to what gets passed to run C, but only for the network side. And so if you think about it, this is what a container engine does. And then and then on the far right side there I show like all the image layers come together get smashed together in a nutshell you can think of them they're overlay they're actually copy on write layer added to the very end which I won't dig deep into but at the end of the day just think of them as container image gets smashed down into a single layer that then gets mounted as a root FS and um, you know again then all these options come together and that's kind of how a container gets ran 
So now I want to, I, I talk about it like I, I kind of dig in a little bit deeper into like where the standards play. So I showed you CNI, OCI runtime, OCI image, and actually distribution is really up there too. I haven't updated this drawing. And then here's where CRI works, right? So CRI is, Kubernetes is talking through the CRI interface to Cryo. So Cryo is a daemon that it understands the CRI protocol essentially. Um, and any, you could plug in anything there for, instead of Cryo. In fact, there's commonly something called a Docker shim where it speaks CRI and then speaks Docker on the other side and then talks to the Docker engine. Uh, Container D has a new branch or whatever called Container D-CRI that speaks this natively. Um, as I mentioned, the Singularity guys are thinking about plugging in Singularity there as a CRI interface. So the cool part here is, is you can kind of see since you're protected by you're kind of, it's notice how Cryo's boxed in here. It's boxed in by standards on every side. So it's boxed in by CNI, you know, the OCI runtime specification, the OCI image and distribution specifications, and CRI. So you can plug Cryo in and out. There's nothing stopping you from moving another, you know, some other, uh, you know, CRI compliant slash OCI compliant daemon in and out of there. And that's the beauty of these, of these, you know, essentially standards. And then I, 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 this was the one I came, I came up with for Dan. He requested that I come up with the one that shows where CRI, CTL, and Podman come in. So this is a little bit deeper version that kind of shows. Now there are some other things going on behind, below the covers, right? Like so, we have, I, I showed we have at this layer we have CRI interface, and that's kind of what defines the interface to the CRI compliant container engine, right? So like whether it's a shim or it's natively supporting CRI, you can plug in or out that container engine. And one of the sides that you care about is the robots, Kubernetes, right? That's a schedule are coming in and talking to the container engine. But on the other side, we have something called CRI CTL. Think of this as the, the human interface to the container engine. Because, and this took a while for it to click for me, but if you want to have pluggable container engines, you, you, you need a standard API that robots can talk to. But then on the other side, you really need a utility that humans can become familiar with. So if I learn how to use CRI CTL, if I just learn how to use CRI CTL images and CRI CTL PS, and you know, it, you'll, you'll notice that the interface is quite similar to what Docker looks like, except for there's no run because it's assumed that with CRI interface you will have kub, the kubelet will be you know basically sending the runs to the engine. But in a nutshell, it's a pretty familiar command line interface. But you can now plug out you know plug out that container engine pretty transparently to both the robots and the humans. And so that's the beauty of like CRI, CRI CTL, and then you know kubelet talking CRI to a CRI compliant container engine. And then one level down, you know, many or most CRI compliant engines will be pulling OCI compliant images from OCI compliant registries through the distribution and image spec. Um, the one caveat there is I mentioned, like, for example, uh, the, the Singularity guys, they could plug in a non-OCI compliant, you know, where it goes and pulls its own container images that are a completely different format, which is fine if that's what you want, as long as you understand that's what you want because you want some other value from that container engine. But then this, then all rules below this would may, might not apply anymore. But but in the cryo world, this is what it looks like. So, so you, you know, you can pull OCI compliant images, then one more layer down, you've got container images and container storage that kind of mandate in a, in a, in a well-defined interface how things get laid out on disk and um, how the images get stored. And to look at that, you can actually do it like a CRI CTL images and see what images are cached locally, but if you want to like tag images and play around with what's in the cache, that's where something like Podman or, or Builder or any of the ones that can talk to the local container cache, you can now go muck around with that stuff at a lower level if you want to. Um, and then and, you know, at the end of the day, though, as I showed in the last slide, everything gets handed to run C. When it gets when it gets fired up, you're just passing it a rootfs and that config.json to to run C, and then run C talks to the kernel in a standard interface. And as long as the kernel features are there, those things get turned on. Whether it's C groups, SE Linux, uh, SVIRT, which I tracked down the other day, and I have a whole deep article on that. Um, and uh, you know, clone whatever clone uh, environment, whatever clone arguments you want to pass. So whatever namespaces you want the container to run in. All that's defined in that run C interface. All right, so what is a container anyway, though? I mean, I think Nalen mentioned he's going to go into this deeper. Uh, it's not rocket science. Like, people, like, it's a black box, and so it's a little bit intimidating when you first start. And I have to admit, tracking down a lot of this in the code and asking Nalen and Dan and a bunch of the guys on the Runtimes team different questions, and I realized there was, a, there, was a, there was a class of people that understood what was going on under the covers, and it was like 5, 10, 15 people in the world. And I was like, we need to, more people to understand this, because, because as architects, when you're building these environments, I mean, I was a 
long time sysadmin, way too long. I have PTSD from it. But, uh, but it, like, you know, sysadmins, architects, people like that need to understand this so that they realize, oh, okay, some of this stuff is not that hard. I can feel a little bit more warm and fuzzy about where I can swap things in and out and feel good and actually get the value out of things I want. So, like, there's places where you might want to swap out the run timer or, or the CRI engine, et cetera, et cetera. But they're not magic, right? At the end of the day, it's just, like, a bunch of metadata and a bunch of files. I mean, it, that's all it is. That's all container images. And the metadata is really, if you think about it this way, it's a way for the human that is building the container images to express to the person that is consuming the container images, hey, here's how I think you should consume this. Here are some sane defaults. Here's the basic command that should run. Like, this is a memcached D container image, so the command is going to be memcached D. Like, that makes sense, right? That's pretty obvious. But as container images get more complex, there's other things that the container builder might want to express to the container consumer. And so you really think about this. This is a human interface. This is, this is for humans to communicate with each other using code. And really, if you think about what containers are, they're a format for collaboration. And the, the analogy that I talk about is, is um, if you think about hardware, hardware was physical letters, right? Like, to get it, uh, I used to get servers from HP or IBM or Dell, you know, and they had to ship them to me, just like a letter. And that was a very slow process of collaboration. Like, if I got the server and it had the wrong OS on it or was not updated to the right level, there was all this stuff where I'd have to call and update the drivers, blah, 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 all these nasty things, and it was very slow and tedious. It was still decent collaboration. I was still o more open than we had in mainframe and even, you know, Unix days, but, but it was still slow collaboration. Then kind of the next level, I joke, is email, right? That was VMs. Email and VMs, they're better. It's not, it's not awesome, though, because like still you have to go. If I want to collaborate with another human being with a VM image, like, like the virtual appliances that VMware tried and failed, um, I have to go you know, pull a, a 10 gig image from an FTP site or from SCP it from somewhere. Um, and whenever I want to collaborate with another human being, I have to mark up changes in that user space, in that VM, change them, save them, and then they have to like, upload them back to them. That's terrible. Like that's like email. It's like emailing back and forth LibreOffice documents and using the markup. And and if you send it out to five people and each of them make changes, you're now screwed because I can't actually get all five changes. I don't know who made changes first, and there might be collisions and all this. But then when you get to containers and you have a format where you can actually define the layers and you can actually see the diffs between the layers, the container image layers. Now we get to a point where the files portion of this and the inputs portion of this are really collaborative, and so we can really collaborate on what the container builder and the container consumer want to do. And so in a nutshell, that's all this is doing. Um, and so there's two basic things, right? There's the config.json, which I mentioned here, and then there is the image layers. And so the image layers get all combined together through a graph driver that basically builds this, you know, this, this root file system, that config.json, then that gets handed off to run C. Um, and then I show a little bit more complex version of it. So, you know, this is the OCI image specification. It defines that you put, you know, these things in that container image. Um, the container engine explodes that stuff, does all the work to actually make it into a root file system, builds the full config.json, hands that config.json and root file system off to an OCI compliant runtime, which could be run C, CAD containers, Railcar, Gvisor. There's a whole bunch of tools that are OCI compliant runtimes, but as was mentioned, you know, run C is, is probably 98% of the world is using that. And then that calls the clone syscall, which then talks to Linux. Typically, Linux operating system could be Windows. Windows has their own syscall layer thing. And then here's the full money shot, as I mentioned. So what are we doing here? There's a container builder. There's a container user. So this is the consumer. This is the builder. And what this person is doing is they're saving a bunch of inputs to kind of communicate, as I mentioned, to the end user. What do I think you should do with this container? Um, and it could be, like I mentioned, a memcached D. And maybe I'm going to set the entry point to memcached D so that this thing always works. And I'm going to set a default username and password for MySQL server, whatever. There's all kinds of things that you can communicate to the end user here. Or maybe you're going to communicate to them that they shouldn't use this without a password, so it should fail out unless uh, you pass uh, an environment variable. Or with like Microsoft SQL Server, their images won't run unless you, you know, agree to the EULA. So you have to put EULA equal Y. Like, so this is a way for the consumer, you know, container image builder to basically pass information on to the container consumer in a really collaborative, cool way, which is way better than VMs. Um, 
and I, I give some examples. Um, at, you know, how they can use to build, build a Docker build, Umochi. There's all kinds of tools that are now building OCI compliant images. Um, you can do it with Podman and a Docker file. Um, and then at the end of the day, what gets happened? What happens is you end up with a, the config. You know, essentially the equivalent of the config on the image side, JSON file. You know, shoved in a registry with a, with a bunch of image layers, and they're a bunch of tarballs. Is all they are. And then, but but I show the daemon or the engine really is what I should change this to because it used to be only daemon and now we don't have big fat, now it's no more, no more big fat daemon so I need to change that to really the engine. The engine now has a job, right? It has to kind of interpolate what's going on in some of these environment variables. Which ones do I want to obey? Which ones don't I want to obey? Which things do I want to add myself? Like a perfect example is if you don't specify a seccomp file, the engine has some defaults. If you don't specify dash dash privilege, the engine has some defaults of what it does with security. Like in, in a Red Hat world, you know, uh, expert is used by default. So it will automatically generate an SE Linux context that's dynamic and uh, unique to that container that fires up, and then it will start that process in that context. Um, those are all defaults that are specified by the engine itself. And then the engine will build the config.json I mentioned, um, and, 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 and it's essentially the user at that point, though, when they go to interact with the engine, they can override some things, right? So I, I give some examples here. kubectl run environment A equal B. So even if you're interacting with it at the orchestration layer, you can override some of these environment variables that might be buried in a container image somewhere. That again, it's kind of a, a, a way for the person that built it to communicate to the user, hey, here's some default, same defaults, but maybe you want to override them because it makes sense. And then again, I already mentioned, kind of gets handed off to run C, one of the OCI compliant runtimes, off to the kernel and then run. So I was going to show, I'm going to show just a quick um, you know, a, an example of this, which I actually already have it running, but uh, so watch this. Like, so the beauty, the beauty here is, right, we can docker run bash. We all understand how to do that. Cat slash Etsy Red Hat release. Right? It makes perfect sense. We've probably all seen that. But then let's, let's do this with, with, uh, 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 here it is. Actually, let's just do it by hand. So podman run dash it rel seven bash. Look at that. Same thing, right? Completely command line compatible. Pretty familiar, right? Like, I think most of you would know how to run that. Like, how many of you feel good with that? <laughs> Pretty easy, right? Now, now, something I didn't talk about is, that, now this CLI interface is not covered by a standard. Neither is the Docker API. So there is one gap there, right? Like if you start, I'll tell you, the one place I would recommend not integrating is directly against the Docker socket or against the daemon where you're actually going back and forth in native you know, Docker API. I wouldn't do that because you're completely not protected then. Then that can change and break. We can protect you with a tool like Podman for the CLI, and then behind that, we can protect you with the image format, the distribution spec, the CRI interface, the CNI interface. You know, these are, you're pretty safe once you get into that. But, but there may be a few places where people have integrated directly natively with the API. That's one place I'd say steer clear from. Doesn't make sense, don't do it. Does that make sense to everyone? So, Let's see. Let's let's let me show you what I did here. So this is basically what I did, right? It's that simple. I swapped out Docker Engine for Podman. Pretty much exactly the same. CLI compatible. You won't notice a difference. Um, you're getting the same output. You're getting the same things happening. Config.json root file system getting generated. Run C's running it. Probably 90% the same code, except no daemon. Um, and and here I'll give you I, I, one other piece that uh, the, the, I wanted to show you is. Uh, Watch this. So we'll, we'll go into another terminal over here, and I'll show you what's going on. So ps tree dash a c. So here's what's happening. You see, uh, it's actually really easy to track down with Podman. SSH daemon, my original bash that I was in. I ran Podman. Here's that bash. Boom! Some things are getting firing off underneath Podman. Um, that's so much easier than trying to do a Docker. If you've ever tried to figure this out with Docker, you could trace this and see what syscalls are happening like inside the process. Um, you have you have a lot better understanding of what's going on in the sub process. With Docker, it's a pain because you have to like trace the running daemon, you know, basically mess with the CLI, send some commands to the daemon, try to figure out what the daemon is firing off. And I've actually ran into this problem where it's actually kind of a nightmare, especially remotely, to figure out what's going on with it. This is a much more elegant interface. This is better for things like. Another use case that came up uh, last week was um, uh, 
the container executor. So they didn't want to use Kubernetes. They wanted to use Yarn. It was a Hadoop environment. Uh, you know, they have their own scheduler. They've already built their own jobs. They probably have a ton of investment in that. But they were using the Docker daemon to fire off containers. That's an inelegant solution, really, if you think about it. And what was happening is, is the, the Yarn container executor was firing up containers and shutting them down so fast that it was corrupting the Docker daemon. Um, because it's a daemon, and it's trying to keep track of all this nasty stuff, right? And so like, they were firing up 1,000 containers, shutting them down real quick, and that can end up corrupting the daemon. In this scenario, it doesn't happen, right? Like, this is just, a, this is just you know, cloning and running, you know, essentially the cloning of a fork and running another process. So there's no client-server interaction. There's no race conditions that can happen where things, you know, you send a command to the daemon, and, oh, it thinks it's already shut down, but it's not shut down, and then, you know, race conditions happen where it tries to send another command to send it shut down. They were running into all kinds of nasty stuff where it would, where it would get corrupted. And so we had them try Podman, and so far they love it. Um, and so this is a perfect example of where we, they were protected because they used the CLI. They weren't tightly integrated against the API. And other, everything else below that, all the container images and everything else were protected by the OCI image. So they could fire up the exact same images with the same command line interface, but in a very different scenario with much better results. And those are the kinds of scenarios, like, people don't care until they do, right? Because usually what happens is you end up in some kind of nasty problem where, uh, where, where something breaks like that, and then you're in, a, you're in a deep pickle. And that's where you start to care. So why would you want, you know, I joke, why would you want to do this, right? Like, well, because, as, I mean, this has already went through pretty well by Dan, but, you know, Fully community-driven, open-source set of tools. You know, small, nimble, core util-style utilities that uh, you know are standalone, can be used to build, can just be used to run, can be integrated with other schedulers in random ways, like the Yarn one. Um, you know, better security can run as non-root. You know, uh, FIPS is something that we're working on now that we've enabled the, the possibility of because uh, because our underlying uh, Goang is is linked against OpenSSL dynamically so that it can be put into FIPS mode. Um, all kinds of like innovations like that. You start to be able to break all this stuff apart and you can really start to mess with some of the underlying things. And again, you don't realize what you need until you actually start to dig into the use case and actually start to build out real production stuff. And that's when like you get burned by having everything buried into a giant POC where it's hard to make changes to this, this big ecosystem of things that are all glued together very tightly coupled. And so um, I, I would just call to action, you know, like here's some good places to go check some things out. Um, go check out Cryo, Scopio, Buildup, Podman. Um, I didn't put Podman on here yet because this is an old slide. But, but, um, and then if you go check out the upstream work in these libraries too because you can kind of see what we're doing and like how they're, how they're leveraged in these tools. Um, and so I'm actually ahead for once. I guess I flew through that. But uh, I guess I'll break and let you guys have any questions. No questions? I'm surprised. Can you run Podman and not do it? I don't know, you tell me. yes. <laughs> Question is can you run Podman as non root? The answer is yes. <laughs> So that's another thing. Oh, that's actually, that brings up a good point. I'll rant about that for two seconds. So I had a guy beat me up on a mailing list one time about like, well, I can run Docker as non-root. I'm like, no, you can't because you're running a CLI as non-root, but it's still talking to a daemon and essentially you have complete root access. So you can run a dash dash privilege container and complete root mount the local file system, you know, do dash dash V or dash V space, you know, slash colon slash mount the local file system completely corrupt it to hell. You are not preventing anything by doing that. It is an illusion of, it is a, a difference between the model in your mind and, and reality, and your threat model is off if you think that you're running Docker as non-root. It is always root. But I, I saw a question over here. Oh, sorry. You had a question? And then he had one, too. Yes. Sir. <clears throat> On uh, Thursday's dojo, uh, Josh Burke has presented uh, Kubernetes in 15 minutes on CentOS. He said install Docker in his instructions to get that done. Would it be possible, I'm from speaking as a novice, to do that without without using Docker? Yeah, you could do it with Cryo very easily. I used to do a demo during this talk where I would actually swap out Cryo live and show how Kubernetes doesn't even care. It actually will keep track of the containers, see that they're not running, and restart them in Cryo. And Because it, it, to it, it's just like pulling that CRI interface, looking for are the containers running? They're not up. It'll try and start them again. So it's actually very, very easy. It's one config line change, basically, is what I demo. And just installing a package, essentially. 
so let's suppose uh, in, in our companies or any company you have a, a private private own infrastructure cloud hybrid cloud and whatever you have so you have deployed these flows in this environment where you have a mix of solution because I feel this more close to private own and not to a, a hybrid or cloud models. So this works in every environment or in a combined environment. I think that's the view. I, I don't quite understand. Is that a question? Like, I, I don't quite understand the question, but like the, I, the idea is yes, like in a, like say Amazon has a registry, perfect example. They have their own registry, right? And if there's no standard, how do I know that I can push my container image into the Amazon registry and then pull it within Amazon, right? Like sometimes you don't want to set up your own registry server, but you want one that's local on that network so that it can fire up quickly, you know, so that say you have a thousand container hosts out in Amazon and you, you don't want to set up your own container, you know, registry, you just want to push into theirs. These standards are what protect you that make sure that will work, right? Like, and that's the beauty. Like, maybe I just want to rent a registry for a few minutes to go cache locally, pull an image, and then blow it out to all these other, you know, container hosts locally. That's really nice to be able to do because that can speed up, you know, distribution real quick for, like, say, a batch job that I just want to run. So that's kind of, this is what protects you to do that. Otherwise, you would have to set up your own registry and make sure that it's compatible with everything, and it would be a pain in the butt. Any other questions? All right, I think we'll 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 drop. So, all right, well thanks. Thank you so much.